of this uh, definition of Chandruan cohomology groups. So recall that H, okay, oh, in general, H D orb of <coughs> some orb folded X coefficients in Q. This is the direct sum twice iota g. <coughs> you can take Dirac or singular here, and this twisted sectors q, and if x uh, is <coughs> given by as the quotient of a <coughs> action of a group on a manifold M where G could be finite or a compact league group, then um, what does this stand for? X G, the twisted sector is the fixed point set of the element G. Uh, so here, okay, I didn't say what it runs over, but here I will say there's a centralizer of G in G, and this G is runs over conjugacy classes of G. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, Professor Su was asking me last time, when does such an action uh, give you an orbifold? And yeah, the condition is that all the stabilizers uh, should be finite. Uh, so that's the condition. So when all the stabilizers are finite, then this. Yeah, uh, there is. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, the, uh, uh, there is a theorem that says that if all the stabilizers have same dimension, mm -hmm. then this is an orbifold. But there, I mean, what they probably mean is that you can always cr uh, take direct product of G with some group that acts trivially. But you have to uh, reduce by that action. So, okay, so I think basically, if G is a the theorem is about action of compact Lie group. So, anyways, so this is from last time what uh, I was doing, <coughs> and uh, what I said is that if X has complex structure, then um, this. I could have the Dolbu cohomology PQ, and it should be reduced by, I mean, push up by P minus iota G, Q minus iota G. Okay, so let us, um, <coughs> and if we were not there last time, okay, okay, and this uh, iota G needs an almost complex structure on the RB fold. And for simplicity, what is an almost complex structure on the orbifold? In this case, uh, this is a G invariant almost complex structure on M. In the general case, if you uh, have a groupoid, then it would be an almost complex structure on the space of objects, an almost complex structure on the space of morphisms, and you would need all the structure maps to be almost complex with respect to those almost complex structures. Okay, so uh, I want to introduce this uh, interesting phenomenon called McKay correspondence.
and <clears throat> this was I mean this has a history but I'm not going to really talk much about the history but for algebraic SL orbitals so SL algebraic means these are algebraic varieties with uh, orbifold singularities and so you must say algebraic varieties means here that these are complex algebraic varieties so <coughs> these are basically algebraic varieties over C <coughs> with so-called quotient. So they have a complex uh, well, analytic uh, topology. And in that topology, the singularities are always of the form Cn mod G. So these are called quotient singularities. So these are locally uh, of the form Cn mod G and <coughs> you want G to be finite <coughs> subgroup of SLN. C. Now finite of course you need for orbifold this G should be finite and SLN is needed so that uh, as a result this condition will imply that any degree shifting number is integer, right? That we <coughs> saw last time. <coughs> can, can you characterize the fact that the groups are in SLM by the type of singularity? Yeah. That is a theorem of, uh, I think, uh, Prill. Um, back in the 70s or something. So, these germs of complex orbifold singularities, they are one to one correspondence with uh, these subgroups of. So, you assume that, uh, yeah. So, if. No, I mean, I mean is there like, like some restrictions or some, some calculation in terms of how, how bad can these singularities be? <clears throat> so, these are all. Uh, these are all uh, kind of not so bad singularities because these are all normal. Uh, any orbifold thing. And the main thing is that you see this kind of reflection is not allowed where you have. Uh, yeah. So I see the fixed point, uh, sorry. Uh, the the single singular these are normal so singular set has to have co-dimension uh, greater or equal to two that's one restriction you have. No, but I mean when you when you ask SLNs, does that have an interpretation in terms of the type of singularities you get? Oh, uh, they they are. Uh, okay, well. I think, uh, sure, in terms of, yeah, I think so, but uh, they, they are called Gorenstein, and you know is, that, is yeah, they are Gorenstein, so, yeah, I think maybe, yeah, so, <laughs> I'm not sure if these are Q, uh, whatever, I mean, but this, these are Gorenstein, I think, yeah. Okay, now, <coughs> so let me just uh, have to rewrite this again. X being uh, complex algebraic variety with SLN um, quotient. Let's just use orbital singularity. Okay. 
then um, the shift of holomorphic uh, n zero forms. Uh, well, anyways, okay. Um, so, okay. There are different meanings to what this would be. Um, what I mean is what I had defined last time. So I will give you maybe an example to show the dif dif two possible different meanings you can have. Uh, okay, uh, n zero forms. These are uh, as as forms on orbifold. So this would be basically <coughs> this invariant, locally invariant uh, forms. Okay, that's what I mean. But in algebraic geometry, you would have a different uh, meaning with for this word. Okay. Uh, <coughs> this shift will be the canonical shift. In algebraic geometry, this would be called, uh, this would have a different construction. Uh, anyways, is in fact. Uh, a vector bundle over x. And, okay, that follows from this fact that uh, this is the, huh? This is a uh, topological vector bundle. So, I mean, yeah, so it's nicer, okay, just a simple, you know, what, what do you mean by the type one of vector bundle, okay? And that is because this is basically N0 forms, so holomorphic N0 forms, but the uh, action is in SLN, so it preserves determinant. So that's the reason why this becomes this descends to a nice vector bundle on the topological space. So let me give you an example. Uh, example would be. So it's a statement then the shift of holomorphy n zero forms, which is kx. Yeah. For kx is the holomorphy n n zero. N zero forms. Yeah. Okay. That, that that becomes a that, bundle. That usual. I mean, in a variety of canonical. Yeah, if you have a smooth algebraic variety, you have a canonical shift is same as this differential forms. Uh, if it is singular, then the construction is different. You have to use this extension uh, shifts. So, okay. So, uh, let me give you a simple example to show. So, X is, say, C2 mod the cyclic group of order 2 and say this action is uh, G, Z2 is say the group gener consisting of two elements and G X on so X1, X2, the coordinates by taking them to minus X1, minus X2 and then of course as an algebraic variety uh, this uh, <coughs> uh, things invariant polynomials are generated by you know or x one squared x two squared x one x two. Let's call them <coughs> u v and W. So as a variety, you can think of X uh, in C3 
with coordinates of VW are defined by uh, UV minus W squared equal to zero, right? And oh, I lost that one. So there is a differential forms on x, omega 2x. Uh, this would be generated by du dv dw, such that uh, you have one relation, u dv plus v du equal to twice w dw. OK? But this kx, sorry. Oh. <laughs> so du dv d yeah etc du dw etc now but this kx uh, is actually so the invariant what is invariant here dx1 dx2 is invariant this is actually generated by dx1 which dx2 and what is this? This is something like 1 over, this is generate 1 over w du dv. So there is a difference. Okay. So there is a difference. <clears throat> okay. Now, So in some sense, this is easier, this shift is easier to define uh, in, for differential orifolds if you consider this algebraic variety as a differential orifold than if you consider it as an algebraic variety. But, uh, <coughs> okay. Now let, <coughs> okay, so let rho from y to x be a, a partial resolution of, so I'm get, uh, coming out of this example now, here x is an algebraic or we call it, so partial resolution of singularity. So you can think of this row as a uh, composition of blow-ups. Uh, okay. So what does, uh, can I assume that, uh, should I need to explain this resolution a little bit or, okay. So what it does, I mean, essentially, I always lose that. Okay. <coughs> what are the properties of rho? Okay. Rho is a regular. Regular means locally. So these are algebraic vari varieties. Uh, this is locally given by polynomials, okay? Rho is birational. That, that means that, that is, it has a inverse, which is no longer given by polynomials, but is uh, rational. That is given by you know, by rational function locally. So, of course, a rational function is not uh, defined everywhere. Whenever the denominator is zero, it's not defined, okay? And, <coughs> and rho is 
isomorphism on <coughs> row inverses, say so isomorphism on x minus the singular locus of x. So as an example, uh, what we can do is, for example, look at, just to get an intuitive idea, what this does is the following. Something like, uh, we had this x, c2 mod z2. This is a surface, right? And the only singular point is the origin, okay? And what you, you would do is, it's hard to draw. <coughs> Resolution would attach, uh, okay. So, it would attach some P1 at the origin. And in a certain way, so the topology is kind of more intricate here, how this P1 is attached. And what happens, this polynomial type map, it contracts this sphere to the singular point. And outside that, it is isomorphism. Uh, one way to think about for curves, this is kind of easy to see. What you do is, <coughs> for a singular curve, say, you have this point of singularity. And this is inside, say, C2. And for each direction, each complex direction, uh, in, in C2, you. Okay. Okay, okay. So fine. So sorry, I'm just uh, wasting. Okay. So well, now you know what is resolution of singularity. <coughs> okay. So, <coughs> okay, so sorry, I shouldn't erase that. Okay, so a resolution is called crepent. So y may be smooth, may be still an RB fold, because he resolved the singularity, but maybe not completely. Uh, if the pullback of the canonical bundle of x equals canonical bundle of y, okay? And yeah. okay, I'll give examples at the very end. Um, so here is a theorem uh, due to Batirev and Deneuve Lozier. So it's the following. If X is Cn mod G, G is finite subgroup of SLN. Then uh, the orbifold, <coughs> okay, and rho from y to x is crepent resolution. Then the dimensions of the orbifold. groups equal to so in particular if y becomes smooth then these are the double numbers of y okay so that this is uh, called this is a version of Mackay correspondence and we have a <coughs>
stronger theorem. that here x any complete algebraic variety over C with SLN quotient singularity row y to x Crepant, then HPQ R above Y X. Okay. Now these theorems are uh, can be pr are proved by. Uh, some technique called uh, motivic integration, which was discovered by Konsevich. So the proofs are kind of abstract. Uh, <clears throat> there is also, you can ask <clears throat> if there is a direct uh, correspondence um, um, between the classes, right? Can you, these are just numbers, equality. Can you, so direct correspondence. If uh, um, x, y, sorry, if x is, I think, uh, C2n mod g, g is finite subgroup of sp, uh, two and C. So this is a complex symplectic subgroup. So X is hyperkähler, and if uh, rho y to X crepant, <coughs> uh, I guess Y also is. Hyperkähler. I don't know if it is naturally hyperkähler or you impose the condition. Uh, then correspondence between uh, classes uh, are we fold homology. Okay. In particular, yeah. in dimension two, uh, SL two C and SP two C, they agree, and that was the first case uh, studied in examples by McKay. And anyway, so there's some history. Okay, so this is kind of what I want to do for quasi tori folds. So I want to define this quasi tori folds. Uh, in some sense, this, uh, you see, this theory of quasi tori manifolds, well, it's nice. Uh, the tori variety theory has, you know, it has also uh, coming with the, this theory, I mean, this on maps between toric varieties, like you have these birational maps. So I want to develop something similar for quasi toric manifolds and orbifolds. So you have this equality of this component in, in your in this last theorem. Yeah. You have this equality. You also have the same equality of the homology. Where? Here. Here, Here yeah. yeah, of course. Uh, uh, this hyperkähler is uh, kind of special. Uh, there is some uh, 
theorem by Ruan which says that quantum cohomology, in fact, it does not behave nicely with respect to uh, maps, but if you have hyperkähler structures and the maps uh, commute with those, then uh, even quantum cohomology in dimension 3 has proved uh, behaves nicely and this is some special case. Anyways, okay, fine. <coughs> So, uh, I won't give you examples now, but maybe at the very end. So, let me try to define quasitoric orbifolds and <coughs> and I'll state some of their uh, properties and then uh, you need either complex structure or almost complex structure to talk about this grading. So I want to put some almost complex structure on quasitory orbifolds, and that I can only do in dimension four. So I'll give some special description of four-dimensional quasitory, and then I will try to construct some uh, blowdown resolution maps, or I'll call them blowdown maps. We'll construct some spheres. And then I study. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, <coughs> so P in Rn. <clears throat> so I'll give you a constructive definition, that is I'll uh, give you a polytope and I'll give you some characteristic vectors and out of that I'll construct this n-dimensional simple and simple just means that at if every vertex of this polytope P there are exactly n co-dimension 1 faces that meet. It's like uh, if you take the uh, first orthant in Rn, then you have this n um, hyperplanes uh, that meet. So it's modeled on that. Simple convex polytope. <coughs> <coughs> Z module. There will be several Z modules probably coming up, uh, so I get to give a name. I, so you name the codimension one faces, and in short, we call these facets of P. Lambda is a function from i to n. So it takes every facet to an integral vector, uh, p, a characteristic function So for many, I just relax the condition slightly. Uh, that is, if facets <coughs> fi1 to fin, n facets meet at some vertex, So not any collection of n facets have to meet, but if they meet, then the corresponding characteristic vectors, lambda i1, lambda i n, are linearly independent. So they do not have to form for manifolds. We know that we require 
this to form a basis of n over <coughs> z basis, but here just linearly independent. <coughs> so in particular, if I take uh, these vectors, take the uh, determinant of the matrix formed by them, it could be any integer. Okay. Here lambda i is by definition lambda of fi. Okay, so with this data, I <coughs> now I define the torus T sub n, this is n tensor R quotient by N. So this is like top is like Rn and N is right. Okay. Now <coughs> if uh, M is a free uh, submodule of n. Okay. Again, you define Tm, of course, by same as m tensor r over m. And then there is a map from <coughs> Tm into Tn. So there is natural homomorphism of Lie groups, <coughs> xi m from <coughs> Tm to Tn. And what is this? This is just uh, m tensor r over m going into n tensor r over m. And then you quotient a quotient, right? Quotient, a divide by. <clears throat> so you go to n tensor r over m. You quotient that by n over m, right? And so this is Tm. So one inclusion and one projection. <clears throat> okay? All right. So I need to define some equivalence relation on uh, P cross T, uh, P cross Tn, right? And, and just, uh, just like quasitoric manifolds. <clears throat> now I need one more definition uh, for any face F. So every face uh, F of P would be uh, the intersection of some facets, right? So F is equal to F I1 to F I K. Let N of F is kind of some kind of submodule uh, generated by the characteristic vector of those facets whose intersection gives you F. So this is <coughs> the Z <coughs> module generated by lambda I1, lambda I K. Okay, now I, uh, and of course, then I can define TNF, right? And <coughs> uh, you just take NP 
to be defined by zero. All right, so now I, I will define the equivalence relation. And also I, <coughs> okay, so define equivalence relation on P cross Tn by the following. Uh, so P comma T is equivalent to Q comma S if P equal to Q and <coughs> S inverse T is so in quasitoric manifold you find the isotropy subgroup, right? And that that is basically the torus generated by lambda I one to lambda I K. So P is uh, P every such P belongs to the relative interior of a unique face, right? So you get an F from there. Now here corresponding to this I have a torus T and F, but it is not inside T N, but I can take the image of that. Okay. So if uh, this belongs to image of xi nf from t nf to tn, where f is the face whose relative interior contains P. Okay? And so we call this X equal to P cross Tn mod this and the quotient P cross Tn to X the projection. <clears throat> All right. Now I need to show that this is an orbifold, right? So intuitively, it's uh, not so difficult. What will happen is that at every vertex, <coughs> uh, M V would be linearly independent. So if and okay. So let's. Uh, Okay. So <coughs> claim that X is an orbifold. Okay. So <coughs> for each <coughs> so at each vertex this uh, lambda I one to lambda I n there will be n n facets meeting, so n of these linearly independent vectors. So you'll get a, uh, this n v for the vertex would be a submodule of uh, full rank and n over n v uh, would be a finite group. That is the idea. So for each <coughs> vertex <coughs> v in p, let u sub v <coughs> equal to p minus the union of faces <coughs> that do not contain v. Right? And let xv be the pre-image of that <coughs> in the torus. <coughs> Let gv, this is n over nv, uh, this is, okay, gv is finite group.
Now I want to uh, produce an orbital chart on this uh, x v. Okay. <coughs> And there is one uh, simple trick. So let me draw a picture, okay? So suppose you have lambda 1. Sorry? G, B, B, N, N, B. Okay, I'll, I'll draw that. So what is N, N, V, or what is capital N? Both. Okay. Capital N is some fixed copy of Z2, Zn in general, here. No, N is the lattice. N is NV. In this picture, you see NV is the submodule generated by lambda 1, lambda 2. Okay, so. This can be a finite index subgroup of this. This is always a finite index subgroup. when V is a yeah. vertex. Right. Okay. <clears throat> now, my, uh, the trick is as follows. Okay. Now, what you do is imagine for a moment. Oh, okay. So, note that lambda 1 lambda 2 is Z basis of NV, right? So imagine for a moment that, you know, locally, that this N never exists for you. You are in NV, NV is all there in your, uni, in your universe is NV. Then you just do the same equivalence relation as you do, and you get a quasitoric manifold locally. So that's it. So I just write it down then. <coughs> okay. So what we want to do is let me raise this and write that down. Okay. <coughs> Okay, now, uh, yeah. Okay. So, I want to build orbifold chart for uh, XV. Uh, so, I want to define. Another equivalence relation on P cross Tn. Uh, so let's see. Not on this one, but on UV cross Tn, local. Okay? Uh, if F uh, contains, if a face F contains V, then MF is contained in NV. Right. Just by this uh, simple simpleness. Simplicity of the polytope. Let <coughs> xi vf from T and F to T and V be the natural map. So, as at the beginning, I had let is uh, submodule M of N, and I had a similar map, right? One 
inclusion on projection. It works for any pair of uh, module, submodule, right? Free. <coughs> huh? That's always a homomorphism. Monomorphism. No, no, no. no uh, oh. oh, let's see. Okay, okay. Yeah, this is of course. This is, uh, this is, yeah, this is right. This is. Uh, yeah. 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 This is uh, injective. Yeah. As uh, basis of an F extends to okay. This is yeah. Crucial point. Um, <clears throat> okay. Define. So you forget n, and locally you define just like quasi toric. Uh, so define v on u v cross t n v. So what did I do? I I made a mistake here. I should have written T and V. Okay, so sorry, sorry about that. This equivalence relation. We are forgetting N basically. So yeah, here too. By <coughs> P S equivalent to Q T. Uh, if again P equal to Q and S inverse T is an image of psi VF <coughs> where P belongs to relative interior of F. And now because this is a, this map is injective, we know by quasi toric from quasi-toric manifolds that Define x tilde v uh, to be u v cross t n v modulo. Okay, is uh, diffeomorphic to open ball in C n. That is now standard. Okay, uh, this diffeomorphism would be, you know, torus equivariant up to some isomorphism of the torus. Uh, so I'll suppress that. And uh, okay, so how does it work now? I have T and F <coughs> going into uh, this is inclusion, right, to psi vf into t and v. And from there, I have a projection quotient by gv into tn. And I have this other map. This is a commutating, uh, commutative diagram, so let me maybe draw it like a square. This is Tn, this quotient by Gv. And <clears throat> here is another map, which is psi and f, that I used to define the earlier equivalence. Okay, And so this is psi 
Okay. And this is a commutative diagram. And therefore, what this means is that I have <coughs> this kind of diagrams, uv uh, cross t n v modulo i v going into this v v to u v cross t n modulo xi so this is x v tilde this is x v and basically this uh, what happens here is just this quotient map of t n v by t n as to t n right and quotient by g v so <coughs> Uh, this x v tilde uh, g v phi v is orbifold chart on x v. Okay, and whether how uh, if you want to really keen to see that these charts do patch up, then uh, compatibility. Of charts, uh, I can see this <clears throat> so this definition I mean the, yeah so this definition and calculation of the topological invariance is work with my student uh, there was an earlier definition and probably Masuda knew this definition but it's not written down. <coughs> they they didn't know this one. They had a slightly weaker definition. So they did. They have a no. They they have moment angle complex quotient by. Yeah. 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 I I know that. So okay. So we checked, and their definition is slightly weaker. Uh, Uh, yeah, you won't get all of the. Uh, uh. So Davis Yanis Kevitt, when they claim orbifold, it's a slightly weaker concept than. Slightly, Europe. this is a bit more general. Yeah. Not so, yeah, not in, yeah, um, <sighs> no, not really, that, that's the difference, for this general orbifolds, you, up to a stage you can, Define momentum complex, and the, there is some finite uh, group action that you cannot. <laughs> but momentum you know. complex is defined, it's independent of classically manifold. You have a polytope, you can yeah. always define more and more momentum complex. And then the only thing is your characteristic map. If you require that, if you relax this condition to be linear independent, then I think I'm sure you would be quoting them. Then there is a small problem, but it is a bit subtle, so I cannot... Uh, there is something called the orbifold fundamental group. And if the orbifold fundamental group is 1, uh, the, then there is no problem. But otherwise, uh, there is a... So there is a finite amount of uh, problem, ambiguity. Okay. <coughs> All right. In this case, is there any such kind of object? Oh. <laughs> I. Uh, I mean, 
uh, well, so what, what I do is the following. Okay, sorry. So you have a moment, momentum complex, and you have the quotient by the principal, whatever. What you get is kind of a cover, a branched cover of uh, your orbifold. So you can go down to your orbifold then by taking some finite quotient. So in that sense, that moment angle complex is pretty good.